So you all know me, I'm Megan Fisher. I'm going to school at Drexel. This is my last class for um, my master's in nursing education. So I'm doing my preceptorship here with Donna Carson. Hi, I'm and, sorry. Um, everybody's just settling in. And I'm doing the education on restraints. I can do a didactic session for 60 minutes, so I'm doing it on restraints. What I'm going to do is, you'll see throughout the presentation, how we're going to make this lecture for the rest of the hospital. How we, a 60 minute lecture for the whole entire hospital is a little too long. So we're just, how, what I'm going to do to break it down a little bit. So help yourself to cookies and coffee over there. And my napkin's not my PowerPoint, so <laughs> please note that. My objectives are um, to be able to apply CMS guidelines when caring for a restraint patient. We're going to demonstrate restraint techniques and documentation and um, value, value the police of utilizing restraints to prevent harm to self and others. These are the same objectives that we'll be using when we do the teaching session with the whole hospital of all the nursing staff. Start off with the story of Florence. Florence is an 85 year old. Um, she's a mother. She was a former school teacher. Can you hear me back there? Because I hear that blower. Do you want us to do your keyboard for you? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Florence had a diagnosis of a stroke, so she was unable to ambulate. She was found dead, slumped on the footrest of her wheelchair, and the restraint was around her abdomen. Now, this is not here, and it's nowhere in any CHS facility, but it's just a story. Her cause of death was asphyxiation. Um, her restraints were applied incorrectly. It's just to prove that restraints do kill people um, if they're not really applied well. Some statistics and facts. Um, <coughs> the Office of Inspector General report states that hospitals fail to report 44 of 104 document restraint related deaths, so it does occur. And um, the FDA estimates that hundreds of restraint related injuries occur each year with at least 100 deaths. And the causes of these deaths are improper sizing with restraints, improper application, infrequent assessment of patients. I found this article um, by Latch, Leach, and uh, Butcher that actually talked about nurses, how they felt about restraints. And I thought this would, this hit home being a nurse, that nurses tend to use restraints more than we should. And it, and it says that we make the decision, we are basically the people that make the decisions to put patients in restraints. Because we're here all the time. We see how they're acting. So we, as nurses, say they need to be in restraints. Um, and that nurses' attitudes towards restraints are positive because nurses prefer, this is what the article is stating, to have their patients tied down, they feel they're safer that way, than for them to be a high, uh, to a false risk or harming themselves. And they also report that nurses claim that they do not have satisfactory alternatives to restraints. So we're, we're the people who request to have orders for restraints, we're the people that put them in restraints for convenience, and we feel that we don't have any resources. And I thought that was kind of sad, because that's, they're blaming restraints on nursing. You know what, I'd be curious to see if nurses here feel that way. It's you know, true. like do a little survey monkey. Yeah, right. Would it? it would be, and I think, I do mm -hmm. see at times, I think nurses do prefer them because the, the patient might be a little bit too difficult. So this is what can, um, what can happen with a person in restraints. <coughs> Death from strangulation, which is what we saw with Ms. Florence. Um, this surprised me, that's why I put it in red. It said increased risk of extubation. I thought that a person who is restrained were at a decreased risk for extubation because you can't get to the breathing tube. But it is not, they say that being restrained can cause extubation. I guess they can wiggle down and they're really focused on getting the tube out. A patient can get a DVT or a PE because they're not really moving. Um, there can be nerve damage, bruising or swelling, and I found this picture which is pretty good of bruises on the patient's hands. Um, it puts a patient at increased risk for falls. That also surprised me, thinking that we put people in restraints because we think it's keeping them safer from falling, but it's actually putting them at increased it can increase a person's confusion, pressure ulcers can occur, pneumonia and incontinence can occur, and it can cause emotional distress. And the last bit, which is very important, is the violation of patient rights.
They recommend um, that ways to reduce restraint use is education, which is what we're doing here at Brandywine, where we have, um, we're going to have a big skills day, we're going to do education sessions. And they say administrative report, and that's really for administration so that if we need extra resources, we need busy, and we'll get into that, busy blankets, or if we need more staff to do one-to-ones, that's where the administrative support is. So CMS, of course, guides how we restrain patients. All patients have the right to be free from physical or mental abuse and corporal punishment. All patients have the right to be free from restraints or seclusion of any form imposed as means of coercion, discipline, convenience, or relation by staff. Restraints or seclusion may only be imposed to ensure the immediate physical safety of the patient, staff member, or others must be discontinued at the earliest possible time. We can only use restraints when absolutely needed to keep the patient safe or the staff safe. That's the bottom line of this whole big paragraph. And it must be, restraints must be DC'd as soon as possible. We don't just keep them in because we have an order. There's some definitions on my little guide covered up my thing. Um, but the definitions for physical restraint is a manual method of physical um, or mechanical devices, it reduces mobility of the patient, so they just can't move like they're supposed to. Um, mechanical restraints are belts or jackets, which is the most common and what, we're, what we are used to using are our different types of restraints, or mechanical. And then manual restraints are holding of the patient, which you might see like in behavioral health, or you might see in the ER. You, you could see it on the floors if you have to hold them, but they won't, you don't hold them forever, it's, it's temporary. This is very interesting and it's um, kind of the new, the new thing about drugs. Drugs are a form of restraint and if it's used to control the person's behavior or restrict the patient's movement and is not a standard treatment or dosage for the patient's condition. So if the person doesn't take that medication at home and we're trying to change them, it is considered a restraint. They said that Ativan for um, alcohol withdrawal is okay because we're not trying to like just trying to help ease the DTs, but if we are trying to change the behavior and think something they physically do not take at home, it is considered a restraint. And then seclusion. Seclusion is also considered a restraint. It's involuntary confinement of a patient alone in a room or an area from which the patient is physically prevented from leaving. To me, sometimes seclusion sounds like it's not quite a bad thing. I would like to be placed in seclusion sometimes. <laughs> but it's when I can't get out and probably be the problem. Um, it is only used for violent or self-destructive behaviors. There is time limits to the length of the order. For a person in seclusion, they can't just be thrown into a room and left there until they behave. And it requires one hour face time um, evaluation to be done. There are several things that are not considered restraints, and it's good to note so that we Handcuffs or shackles by law enforcement are not considered restraints. Orthopedic devices, surgical dressings or bandages, protective helmets, um, having the side rails for seizures is not a restraint, special air mattresses or postural support devices. The one gray area that most people get confused about are mitts, and actually mitts, um, unless they are, mitts cannot be tied down and the fingers cannot be so the way we use mitts at Brandywine Hospital, we always have the fingers closed like boxing gloves and they're tied down. That is a restraint. But if their fingers were out and it wasn't tied down, then it's not a restraint. So that's something good to know. And then I found this kind of humorous. The CMS does not consider the use of weapons on patients by the hospital staff <laughs> safe. I said, does that really mean noted? Because it's not a no brainer. But it's totally in the section about what a restraint. And I thought, well, I'm putting it in there. So please do not bring it <coughs> They probably asked that after that guy, you know, the doctor fit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there are two types of restraints. There is non-violent, non-self-destructive, and violent and self-destructive. Violent destructive is used to protect the patient and others against the it's used to protect the patient and others from injury. Seclusion is the only use with violent behaviors. I did mention that before. 
Restraints and seclusion at the same time is only permitted if the patient is continually monitored by trained staff via audio, video monitoring, or face-to-face -face monitoring. And placement of restraints are not confined to any area. So a patient can be placed in these, and I can show you the two different types of restraints. They can be placed anywhere on the floor anywhere. It is based on the situation. There are many alternatives you can do to restraints, and this is where the education and administrative support come in. Sitters can be an alternative to restraints. It was actually used on the floor the other day. A sitter was placed to get a patient off of restraints, so they had been restrained for a little while and was not safe. So they put a sitter to sit with them to keep them safe. Bed or chair alarms, um, an activity apron. We did have activity aprons for a while. They had different things that they could do, like tie and play with a like crunchy uh, paper on it. They said place a stop sign at the door. That's a pretty good idea for the demented patients. It makes them like think if they're going outside the room. Um, exercise and ambulation, I've seen many people take patients that are a little disgruntled for walks and it's calmed them down, it makes them tired. Toileting, have the beds in the lowest position. Of course, fall precautions. And a lot of these are kind of fall precautions too. They're going hand in hand. Comfort measures, education, um, decreased stimulation, decreased caffeine, having the television on or music so they're not bored sitting in the room, and um, food, food and hydration. So there are many things you can try first before you tie somebody down. There are only four determinations of use per CMS guidelines, and determinations would be danger to self, to maintain a safe environment, to prevent the patient from removing vital equipment. This is the one we see the most in the intensive care unit because there's so many lines and tubes that could be the patient can pull out. Physically attempting to harm others or property, the person's, if the patient's very, very violent and trying to hurt other people, and if the patient has a lack of understanding to comply with safety directions, they just don't understand that they that it's unsafe, that they are the only excuses, I should say, to use restraints. There are some rules to restraints. You're only used after less restrictive interventions have failed. We've tried all the other things and it's just not working. Then we have to escalate up to restraints. Um, the least restrictive te techniques must be first used, but also documented. You might have tried it, but if you don't say that you tried it on the documentation, you don't, it's not, it didn't happen. So side rails, hand mitts that are, remember, the mitts can't cover the fingers and can't be tied down, but they can, hand mitts can be tried. And then, of course, if we have to move into the soft restraints, we will. This is actually the hospital problem. <laughs> um, if we start the hand mitts, we go into soft restraints. And then, of course, if it's very, very bad, we move into neoprene for others. A request from a patient or family member is not a significant basis to restrain. And I know that sounds kind of like a no-brainer, but it, Nurses are asked by family, can't you just tie mom and mom? Just so that we don't have to, you know, they're, I'm going home and then I just tie her up so she doesn't fall. It's, it's not okay. We can't restrain her because we think that she'll be safer. We'll, we'll take care of her. When you're ordering restraints, um, every restraint must have an order. There are no PRN orders for restraints. You can't say, you know what, let's put them on if you need them. It's, it's either you need them or you don't need them has to have an order. When an order is placed, there must also be a plan of care for the patient in restraints. On our computer system, we have what we call IPOX, and they, it should be in there letting us know what we, what we plan on doing with the patient who is restrained. Efforts must be made to notify the family that the patient is restrained. And we that, that can be a problem. I've had people come in and say, I didn't know that my husband was placed in restraints last night. Well, it was a very good reason, and after you explained to her why her husband was placed in restraints, she understood that it was unsafe to, he was unsafe to the to himself and to the staff, and she completely understood, but it was shocking for her to come in and see him like that. So an effort must be made to let the family know. And then if it's not the attending physician who put the order in for restraints, we must notify the attending physician as soon as possible. If a hospitalist does it in the middle of the night, 
then we have to call in the morning to the tent. Non-violent restraint orders need renewed every day. They must be time limited and they must state the type of restraint use. So soft wrist restraints, you know, 24 hours and the reason why. They're pretty easy to learn. It's the violent restraint orders that are a little bit easier. Violent restraint orders are more difficult. They have a one hour rule. Patients must be seen and evaluated within one hour of the initiation of the violent restraint interventions. Time limit for orders are four hours for adults, two hours for children nine to 17, and one hour for children under nine. That just breaks my heart that, we, that violent restraints would be used for kids, but it's, it does happen. Patients must be removed from restraints and re-evaluated every 24 hours by uh, LIP. We do have seclusion rooms here. We have them in the Behavioral Health Pavilion and the Emergency Department. The Behavioral Health Pavilion has three rooms um, and the Emergency Department has one room. And all staff have keys. In the rooms, the beds are bolted to the floor. Apparatuses to secure um, the restraints are in there. The rooms are free from anything that could cause injury. And there's a live video monitoring is recorded at the nurse's station so you can see what's going on. It's just to note again that drugs are considered a restraint. In the past, this has kind of been blown over. The drugs haven't been considered a restraint, but they are. And we talked about before, if you use them to restrict the patient's freedom of movement um, or it's something that they haven't been taking, you're trying to alter them, it is considered a restraint. If you do administer them, then you have to do some checks every 15 minutes for two hours, depending on the type of drug. So just like you would frequently check the person who physically put in restraints, you have to physically check a patient who you gave chemicals to as a restraint. anywhere into the restraints, but it's definitely something to be noted, that if someone would happen to die with restraints, that CMS has to be notified by the end of the business day. Um, if the hospital suspects death or injury has occurred due to restraints, that they must notify the, it's actually in the, in the wrong order, the quality director, so the nursing supervisor, and then the quality director will be notified risk management's notified, and then, of course, it will be escalated to the CEO if need be. But if someone dies in restraints, we have, someone has to know about it from the quality office because it definitely is investigated. So the, the big problem with restraint use is not as much use as documentation. That's where we are finding that we really need to educate the staff here at Brandywine White Hospital for. <coughs> Documentation must be um, done every two hours if a person's in restraints, and it must include the following things. We need to offer them fluids. We have to check their vital signs, but that's more towards the unit policy. Vital signs do not have to be checked every two hours. You don't have to do a blood pressure every two hours on someone in restraints, but you do have to check vital signs on someone in restraints per the unit policy. Toileting should be off offered, removal and reposition, um, circulation to restraints need to be physically taken off and the patient needs to be, you have to look at their skin integrity. You want to note their behavior. Are they, are they, do they even need to still be in these restraints? Maybe two hours ago, yes, but now, maybe not so. They, you have to assess that too. Debriefing is recommended every 24 hours to identify the cause of restraints and how to prevent the use for um, violent restraint use. Here is our documentation on Cerner at the Brandywine <coughs> Hospital. What we're finding the problem with documentation is is that sometimes this is the only thing filled out. And although skin integrity is very important to document when you are re when a person is restrained, it is not enough documentation. And this is where we're finding the problems are. So if, if this shows up in the restraint 
evaluation section is not enough. What needs to be done is that, oops, I'll go back and point it out. This little bingo card here needs to be clicked. And once that's clicked, this will come up. And this lets you put where the restraints are and what type of restraints they are. After you do that, then you get more things to chart on, which talks about the behavior that we, we spoke about that we must talk about, the activity. It gives you everything to chart on. This is something we're seeing a lot that is being missed on the floors, and this is what we're going to re-educate on. We're going to hit this pretty card in skills today. CMS requires training. It must be done to staff on orientation and yearly. It must be done um, to show application, how to monitor patient restraint, provide, and providing care. Training also must include some de escalation. So, the training plan for the staff at Brandywine Hospital is this PowerPoint, which is kind of long for the staff on the floors. I'll break down and put the most important parts on a poster. We're going to have skills day, skills week actually, in May. I have a quiz which I handed out that will be part of the quiz from the PowerPoint that I'll put on a poster for it. But Rhonda, who is our informaticist, is going to help us set up computers so that the staff can demonstrate and document on restraints. And that's very important because I think some of the I think as we audit the charts, we're finding that that's what's being missed, that they're not properly documenting. So we're going to have them demonstrate documentation, so we'll get that right. And we're also <coughs> going to have to demonstrate, which I'll show you, restraints and how to put them on, properly put them on, proper skin checks, and how to take them off. That's all our plan, which is the same basis as the CMS guidelines for application. the basis to, to build off. 